Uh, my name's Judy Cataldo. Um, I have been spinning for over 40 years. <clears throat> and I've been demonstrating both historic spinning, modern spinning, uh, running events. Um, and as I've been looking at historic spinning as it's being done at various sites the last few years, I've been really noticing how modern technology and techniques have been sneaking in, and our modern attitudes have been sneaking in to how they were doing it in the 18th century. So what I want to share is just some of the facts and fictions of spinning, how we can present maybe the manufacturer a little bit better. Um, I am, as I mentioned to someone, I'm probably going to be going against what's being commonly said out there, so um, we'll see. Um, Boston in the 18th century, of course, had its share of widows, dependent children, um, and uh, charitable organizations like the Overseers of the Poor looked for ways to give the children some kind of little better life. I'm, we might debate that now, um, and send them out into arranging apprenticeships. So boys went into a lot of the maritime trades um, or out to farms about evenly. Um, girls were sent out to farms, usually, or to a home. And they were either um, to be taught to learn to uh, sew, knit, and spin, or as this one says, uh, they were to in taught in the best way and means possible the art and mystery of a spinster. <laughs> and to read and write, because <laughs> this is New England and they need to read their Bible. So my basic hypothesis on this, or theory, is that if indeed there are, this, there is an agreement. This is a legal document that says this person is going to, this child is going to learn this to the best of their ability. So obviously there's going to be some kids that maybe can't. But that there is a person out there who can teach them how to spin. So there are spinners. Um, another source is inventories. Um, so I was looking at probate records. I'm from Westford. And um, we have our records are out there, which is great. So I looked at probate records from 1750 to 1760, so pre-non-importation. And in what is in, what is non non importation is the time in the 1760s when we were trying to boycott British okay. goods. Yeah, sorry. So that's usually when you hear about the yeah. spinning bees and all these women spinning. So I wanted to look at the years before because I wanted to see how many spinning wheels I was finding before they were going out and buying them in the 1760s. So 23 inventories, four of the inventories did not list household goods at all. The remaining 19 all listed spinning wheels, plural. So foot wheel and great wheel, as in this one, woolen wheel and a linen wheel, um, and also a loom, and also, actually this is a really good inventory, he also lists um, fiber for spinning and thread and parts of the loom in no particular order. Usually an inventory, you can trace it through the house. Not this one. It, I think that the five, the three men who went in to do the inventory all made their own lists. And then when they compiled it very neatly, he didn't like then reorder it. Um, so the wheels, and the other thing, point here is that the every time I find a wheel, it's either in the front room in use or it's in the storage room off the kitchen. And they're always either the first or last thing mentioned, which means they're right there, easy to grab. And 18th century households like to keep things neat, so when you were finished using something, you put it away, like we all do. <laughs> um, and none of these, not one of these wheels, or anything else, was in the attic. And why do I mention that? Because it is common today to hear some historic sites and reenactors say, 
in the 1760s, women got their spinning wheels out of the attic and taught themselves to spin. The problem is it's the wrong 60s. That was the 1960s. <laughs> Whereas today, it's really easy. Go online, find a spinning wheel. Then there was no infrastructure. It was really hard to find one. And it was also, find, you couldn't find one that was new. You needed an antique one. So you went up to somebody's attic. You'd always hear about somebody who had one in the attic. And you'd go and you'd find one. And then you went to the library, and you got a book, and you taught yourself to spin. Obviously, there were spinners around in 1750 and 60 to teach. But we, in that 20th century spinners, we did not have that advantage. We are the ones who had to ta teach ourselves to spin. So yeah, the 60s, just the wrong 60s. Um, another example of how much spinning had to have been done are the fulling mills. Now, once the woolen uh, fabric has been woven, it now needs to be shrunk and dressed. And it's a long process. I won't go into the, all of the process, but to say that it usually, it's usually said that it takes about five spinners to support one weaver. And there are towns with multiple spinning, with multiple fulling mills. So, so far I've located 34 uh, fulling mills, um, all before um, 17, 70, and they go from Cape Cod, where there is an ex really surprising, there's eight on Cape Cod, two on Martha's Vineyard, one on Nantucket. There was some serious textile going on down on the Cape. And you're finding them all across. They're usually within about 10 miles of some place. And then there's some places like Rowley. Rowley is the first fulling mill. Uh, it was 1646, and there are, uh, again, by 1750, there are three fulling mills in Rowley. That is an unbelievable number of spinners and weavers to be supplying that. So a pulling means that it's shrinking. Yes. Oh. Full. F-U-L-L. Yeah. Ah, fuller. fuller is earth. Oh, fuller. I thought yeah. Full. You're oh. fulling it. It shrinks. Right. Um, yeah, we, we incorrectly refer to it as felting. Uh, so for knitters, you know, the felt, it, it's fulling, not felting, but hey, the instructions say felt. If anybody's in my Scottish talk, this is the same as the Scots women doing walking. W walking, yeah. Oh, the walking wheel. The, no. Oh, no, 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 definitely U-L-K, totally oh, different. Oh, oh, okay. You can right. full, so before there were fulling mills, you could walk the wool, W-A-L, it's W-A-U-L-K. Yeah, okay, yeah. And that's, it's what it sounds like. You put it into hot water and soap, and you walk on it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, like in a basin, kind of like mashing grapes. Right. <laughs> and there's other methods for doing it to, to get the fibers to knit together. But the rest of the process, and that, that really shows the machinery. And that's, um, yeah. that's showing, I know there's a red thing here. Is there a red dot? <gasps> there's a red dot. OK, these. Those are, um, those are bashing it. So it's on a trip hammer, and those are coming down and bashing the woven fabric in hot water and soap. And it will go through that process several times. It will then get stretched to back into shape. It then goes through another machine that's going to brush up the nap on it. And then with giant shears, as in like really giant shears. They will, it will come in and trim off all the fuzz. And that's how you get your nice worsted, your well-dressed fabric. Okay, spinning had, had worth. This is something that has, it is worth money. Woman's labor, so we can see what men owned men made uh, for farm labor. And this is 1778, Congress and other municipalities were starting to set prices 
because there um, was price gouging going on during the revolution. Who'd have thought? <laughs> and so for spinning yarn, per run, um, and that's about a day's spinning, is one shilling, two pence. <coughs> it has worth. The foot wheel and uh, woolen wheel, that's how much they should cost. Wool, three shillings a pound. Well-dressed flax, one shilling, six pence. So these items have worth. And here we have something from the 1768. And this is someone, he went out and he bought 30 pounds of sheep's wool. And he paid one and six per pound. And then he bought the indigo. He paid for it to be dyed and spun. Paid for the weaving. And, um, and then to the clothier's bill, that's the fulling. Uh, and the pressing, which is what makes it nice and nice and flat. And he got, so he got his uh, 20 yards of fabric for about uh, eight pounds, one, uh, shillings one, I mean, it should be eight shillings, one pence per pound, uh, per yard. So he's, and he's saying this is really good wool. Again, it has worth. Um, and here's our friend, hopefully everyone knows this young lady, Anna Green Winslow. Um, Anna Green Winslow learned to spin. That was part of her training that she got when she came here to Boston to live with her um, relatives. Um, as would happen with young girls, they would be sent someplace so that they could kind of get finished off, meet the right people take classes, and she was trying to perfect herself in learning to spin flax. And that's on February 9th, and she was doing well, and she was working on it. By Valentine's Day, so five days later, um, her cousin had reeled off 10 knots, so about 900 yards of thread. And um, yes, the yarn was of my spinning, and Aunt says it will do for filling. Now, when I first read that, I misunderstood filling, and I shouldn't have, because I should have known better. And I thought it's stuffing. It's not stuffing, it's the weft in weaving. Yeah, the cross part in weaving, what you're weaving through. The warp has to be stronger and has to be spun differently. But the weft, and that's in a few days, she was able to spin something that was usable, not to be thrown out. I have a question. Mm -hmm. a, from what I know of flax, it takes a long time to get the fibers out of the yes. plant. Would she be doing that work? No. Or just she would have bought that well-dressed flax. She would have bought it. Okay. Yes. They would have bought, in Boston, they would have brought the well-dressed flax. If she were a farm girl, would have done all that then, work. no, her father would have done most of that. It's usually men's work, just because yeah, of the, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, this next little modern intrusion, I may be responsible for. <laughs> I was listening to someone talk about spinning, and they said, Oh, well, at those spinning bees, they just threw out the yarn because it wasn't any good, because they were just learning to spin. Now, these are teenage girls who would probably be spinning since they were Anna Green Winslow's age, about 12, who were doing these spinning bees or spinning matches. The amounts that they were spinning were pretty good amounts for spinning for the whole day. They'd usually start these matches at like really early in the morning and go until dark. Um, and I'm sure there, there was a lot of gossiping and other things because I know what spinning matches are like. Um, and they're saying that after spinning all of that, it was just no good. They'd give it as a gift to the minister and the minister would go, the minister's wife would go, oh, well, no, we already, we've, I've already shown there's spinning, there's good spinning, 
Anna Green Winslow in five days can produce something that can be used for weaving and is acceptable. This is an upper middle class family. So I was spinning one day in this rather dark room and there's one thing about a flax wheel and that is it's all wood and if you start in the morning it's okay and as you get into the afternoon if it's cold and damp it stops pulling in and um, I was saying to in front of a group of reenactors that oh I got home and I looked at what I had spun and I had to throw out the last hour's worth because it was it was I couldn't repair it. I had so overspun it, um, so it was kinked on itself. It was useless. Mm -hmm. And someone, again, didn't have those listening ears on, and is telling people that they always, everyone threw out their yarn. Well, no, <laughs> I threw out my yarn, and in my defense, I put it in the compost, not in the trash. But, yes, so how do we know about some of these spinning techniques for the 18th century. Treatise on the Propagation of Sheep, written by John Wiley, 1768. Now, I was told, not sure how true this is, but I was told that um, he came to New England to study how textile production was done, and then wrote this specifically for Virginia, where there was very little textile production being done, to encourage people in production. Now, what he says is mostly about um, how to take care, how to raise your flax, how to take care of your sheep, etc., and has a tendency to say things like, spin in the usual way. So, <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah. so it does kind of tell us that they already knew how to spin, yeah. but you needed that specialty thing, like going to those classes or, or reading, for me, reading Spinoff Magazine, I'm going to find out how the best way to spin that fiber is. I already know how to spin, but I may need to know if I need to do a certain angle or hold it a certain way. And that tends to be kind of what he's saying in there. Um, When we tend to do modern spinning demos, and this is, I bet you've all seen at a spinning demonstration, the spinner takes a handful of wool out of the bag, probably shows you that it's still greasy, cards it, and spins it on her flax wheel. Well, not exactly how it was done. And I think this would make a whole better, part of this would make a much better demonstration than that would. So first, what he's saying is, my red dot, wash the sheep in the stream, then put them up in pasture for a week or so. Let, let some of the, so you've washed the dirt out, now you're letting the lanolin come up the rest of the way. Then shear them. And then the next step, of course, is carding. And here's his instructions for carding. And again, this is not what we're doing. So first, you're going to put your fleece out and separate it out into the sections for the various parts of the sheep. The wool grows differently on different parts of the sheep because the sheep has been standing out in the weather and getting weathered differently. So you separate out your wool first, then you wash the fleece. <laughs> I wish I knew this 20 years ago. And then you're going, and then to card it, we have that, that's at the bottom here. Circle um, with one hand, pluck off small quantities at a time and throw it all together in a pile in the middle as you've been carding these light bats. Let it mix up, pick them up again, and do it again. So instead of combining the carding with the spinning, or even doing spinning at all, what a great demo that would be to just do the carding, which is what a lot of times these are school kids. Wouldn't that be a great demo to do with the school kids? They can see what the carding part is, what they would be doing as little kids 
because they wouldn't be spinning yet, mostly because they just don't have the dexterity. Um, there are some times where they talk about eight-year-olds spinning, and I think, well, maybe today, because with better eye-hand coordination, but usually kids can't manage the flax wheel until they have multiple coordination, and that's usually around 10 or 12. So the spinning wheels. This is a great wheel, also known as um, a wool wheel, or um, sometimes as a walking wheel, and that's because you walk while you're spinning. It is pretty basic craftsmanship. So someone with kind of advanced woodworking skills is going to be able to make this because the most technical part is the screw here, which is the tensioner, and that's what's going to be pulling, pulling it tighter, pulling that drive band tight by moving the mother of all that forward. There were spinning wheel makers here in Massachusetts as early as 1635-ish. Um, um, and we know that because, uh, for anyone with the History Camp Tour a couple years ago, the Fairbanks House, he was a spinning wheel maker. We, there is an unknown spinning wheel maker around that same time in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Next, flax wheels. Flax wheel is much more technical. So April 19, 1775, Lexington Green, Captain Parker. Captain Parker was a, a woodworker doing precision things, making cases for um, nautical tools. He also made spinning wheels. And that's why someone like him would need to make a spinning wheel because of the te technical things involved in making spinning wheels. Fun names the table, the mother of all, the maidens, distaff, footman. So Flax wheels we can see. So, and these are a couple of the flyers. Um, this top one, uh, you see this metal part, it's called the mandrel. And it's actually narrow, it's beveled in. So that it really only lets you spin, it's, it's made to spin fine, fine thread. Um, it has replacement hooks on it. Those are modern cup hooks. This is, has the original hooks. They are bent wire. And I can tell you from experience, if you're spinning it all unevenly, you're, it's, everything's going to catch. This, um, this whorl, W-H-O-R-L, um, there's very little difference between those two grooves. So essentially, a flax wheel has what's called one ratio or one speed. So it only does that one thing. It spins long fiber, whether it's flax or worsted wool, which when it's combed, it, is, it comes in these big, long bats that, again, you would dress on a distaff and spin from a distaff. That's what it's meant to do. My modern wheel has 12 ratios. And it has an option for 12 more. It has a wide orifice because I'm going to be spinning a lot more variety of fibers on it. I can spin anything from one inch slippery cashmere to a long llama on it. Flax wheels and wool wheels just did the thing that they were invented for. There's very, you're spinning either wool, flax. Uh, wool wheel can also spin cotton. But that's what you're spinning here in New England. The modern, pardon me, and of course the distaff. The distaff being up there on top, how we know, yeah, we've always, uh, the modern term for women, distaff, your distaff side. So I pulled some photos. Actually, these are all European, not English, uh, photos of spinning wheels and spinners. Every one of them has a distaff. Um, and what she's doing in that first one is oiling the wheel. 
they always have a disc staff. Modern wheels almost never have a disc staff. Um, I went on to the website for a place that does sell spinning wheels, and I found one. And it's an upright spinning wheel, and upright spinning wheels didn't get here, um, according to the spinning wheel sleuth, until around the mid the early 1800s, uh, with the exception, of course, of this very odd wheel in Chester, Pennsylvania. But for those of us who are reenactors and we know about clothing, Chester, Pennsylvania is kind of has the odd thing out for everything. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so there's a type of spinning I haven't mentioned. It's a little controversial. And that's the spindle. Oh, yeah. Was the spindle here in the colonies? Most people feel that it was not because, again, we had all those spinning wheel makers, so we didn't need spindles. Spindles are for people who can't afford a spinning wheel. They still are. And were they here? Would an older woman who had seen their grandmother use a spindle and whose granddaughter's using the spinning wheel use a spindle? Maybe, as long as it's with a disc staff. We have now had about three generations of school kids that have gone through our programs and learned that children learn to spin on a drop spindle. Colonial children learn to spin on a drop spindle. Well, that's not a drop spindle. I know it looks like it if you're not acquainted with the method. That's not a drop spindle. It's barely gonna leave her hand. It is, the spinning is taking place here, and she's, for the most part, holding on to that spindle and turning it. And sometimes, once it gets going, you can turn it for a bit, but then you keep spinning from up there, and it drops usually no more than a few inches. It's always within reach of your hand, different from a drop spindle. So what about these colonial kids who learned spinning from a drop spindle? There they are. They don't use a distaff. Um, that spindle, that style of spindle, came to the United States in the 1960s um, by uh, an anthropologist and his family. Uh, they spent time in Peru, learned the method, brought it back, and there it was, the way you can spin and not have a spinning wheel. It was perfect. Didn't the Greeks and Romans do that too? Yes, but we're talking mostly about here. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, they did. They also used distaffs. Uh, Roman distaffs being a little bit different, they're short, uh, but they used distaffs. The only places, there's only a couple of places that wrap the fiber around their wrist and spin with a drop spindle. And one of them is the Peruvian Andes, a very specific portion of the Peruvian Andes. <laughs> and then Turkey and Afghanistan. None of those people were here in 1770s. It's a matter of it came here, we were desperate for a school program, and there it is. So why do people still think there's spindles in New England in the 18th century? Well, it's actually probably this. Proverbs chapter 31. She lays her hand to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. This scripture verse is in the majority of editorials in the newspaper encouraging local manufacture, whether it's during the 1760s or earlier. They actually started with these um, editorials started in the 1720s, 30s. It's always in there. It doesn't mean as much to the modern reader, and even the reader in the late 19th century didn't always click to what this meant. So they just saw spindle in the newspaper. Well, of course they had spindles. But in the 18th century, Proverbs 31 was a very popular chapter to read because it told you how to be the godly woman, how to run your household. And before you think it's too misogynist, um, the godly woman sees a field and buys it. Uh, she does deals in the marketplace. 
Her family is always dressed in scarlet. Uh, she's a businesswoman. But this is who we have to blame and the Frankenmonts for bringing the spindle back from Peru. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Abby. Uh, for this, this idea of spindles in New England. And also, for those of us who were around during uh, the 70s, living history was new. This idea of school programs was new. People were desperate to find something and to include women in it. So to have spindles and spinning as your program was really important. So it just kind of crept in there. And we never checked on it. And here we are years later with people spinning with drop spindles. So what do we do about spindles? Well, one of the thoughts is actually the bent coat hanger. And it's actually better. Someone said we use drop spindles because it teaches the kids the concept of spinning. And I said, it teaches kids the concept of frustration. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a spinner in our spinning group who is, has been spinning for years, longer than me, I think. She is, she teaches, she is considered an expert in spinning. If I am spinning with my spindle, I swear she turns green. She, every time she even thinks of spinning with a spindle, she's just horrified she can't do it. I can never get one of those to work. This is an expert spinner, can't get one of those to work. And we're asking school kids to do it? If instead, you hold on to this hooked bent coat hanger that you've padded and you've actually, you know, sanded the edges, you turn it. That puts the twist in. Now the person drafting only has to keep up with you. Because I know sometimes I remember doing a program and they had one of the kids keep the spindle going and the other kid try and draft, and that's impossible. Nor can they always get the coordination of getting it to turn and drafting. But with this, all they're doing is drafting, you're doing the turning. And when they're done, when they've played out that bit of carded wool, you take the end, you have them put their finger up, you wrap it, and you let it wind back on itself and ply it. And now they've got a bracelet to take home. They've got a thing they did. They've seen the process more close up. So hopefully um, we've got a little bit better idea of how 18th century spinning worked, that it had value, that it had worth, that it maybe even was something bigger than what we want to think of it, um, that this was a serious industry here. And um, I think we owe our foremothers that to make sure everybody knows how spinning worked. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Um, actually, can I get the name? Uh, can you repeat the name of that uh, source that you were using from Virginia? Treatise on the Propagation of Sheep. <laughs> it is online. Okay. Um, sometime tomorrow. So I think on the on the description of the class, they put my blog that I like never write in, <laughs> um, and I will put up a list of resources. So some of these sites that have that information, and of course, Treatise on the Propagation of Sheep, um, tells you pretty much everything. And, um, and I'll also provide a link for someone who shows how to do that, the spinning with the distaff, just so you can see the difference. Um, ladies, he's from Italy, and he's young. <laughs> <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> yep. That was my question. Was this um, a gender-based kind of home industry that only women did the spinning and men didn't? Pretty much. Yeah. So just because it was yeah. manufacture of clothing, it was inside, it was... Men tended to be the weavers, the fullers, wool combers. Um, I didn't include the image for the wool comber because I felt it was like taking a different direction. Wool combing um, 
sometimes you'll see them in museums, but what you're seeing is the one wool comb, and it's massive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, they kill people with them. St. Blaise. Um, and I think there's somebody's mystery novel, too. And they're huge, and they're heavy. And how, but why you're seeing that one, you always see those. And it, so it looks like you'd take two and go like that, like carding, and you don't. Because what the other one is lost to time, because they would have multiple of these big combs, and they'd sit into a, an oven where they'd heat. Um, also, probably some water, because actually it does work best if you can steam them. So they say for modern, put them over a humidifier. The, it, them being the, car, the, the comb. Combs, the, yeah, the comb. comb. So, so it's and then the other comb was mounted on a wall. And this is absolutely men's work because they would take those big combs and comb down. And images from the Middle Ages, images from the 19th century, and photographs from the 20th century all show these men in the exact same body position. This is something that didn't change for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, and when they comb it, you get these long, 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 long bats. Now when you and that's producing worsted. Is that worsted? That's for worsted. Yeah. yeah. And if you're doing that with hand combs, you're just doing like a little bit. And everyone who I see use them, they use them like they're a pair of cards. It's like, why bother? It's, yeah. What's, it, a, mm -hmm. what's a hatchel? Is that for flax? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hatchel's for flax. And that's the thing with the spikes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes, flax is the problem with describing flax. If I talk about wool, and I say, if you don't know what wool, co wool cards are, OK, wool cards are like dog brushes. Yes, exactly. Right? And then I take that, and I spin it, and I show you twisting. It, you know, it, it's words you understand. They're words that you can get a mental picture for. So with flax, you break it. First you red it, and then you break it. Uh, oh, pardon me. First you ripple it. Then you red it and break it and scotch it or swingle it and then hatchel it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's another language. It doesn't, you, know, you have to have the photos to go with it. So actually when I do a program and I need to explain it to people, I say, I say okay, see over there on the desk? See the photo album? Look at that. Because I'm doing 18th century, I shouldn't have a photo album. But do men do that, or do women do that? Mostly men. Yeah. Women could do it, and especially once it gets down to the hatchling. Um, but it always sees the images are always men. Right. If you see images, it is men doing it. And they also will sometimes talk about redoing it before they have a group over to spin. Uh, one of the things about spinning bees is, yes, in the 1760s, they were political. Before that, they were organizing a bee. A bee, um, I keep my definition here, and my extra piece of paper. A bee, I'm not going to be able to read it. It's too tiny. OK. <laughs> uh, so a bee is a medieval word, actually from the medieval word bene, for to, um, to do a kindness for, to do a favor for someone. It also then means organizing a group to get something done. So the uh, description given in the OED was a man who's saying, I need to get my shed built, so I organized a bee. Now, in the newspapers, they're called spinning matches. But in the countryside, they were called bees. And before non-importation, which is when you're making the political statement by being there with doing all the spinning, these were organized to get your crop done. So for one, one particular spinning bee in the 1750s, um, they described getting it done. And then again, they give the fiber back to the minister. Well, of course, it's his fiber. And I did a little, you know, from what I could tell from vital records, his daughters were grown and married. They had no one to do the spinning. A married woman has the responsibility of the household. 
she cannot spend two hours a day spinning. Teenage girls who need to keep busy, who need to be learning the wifely arts, who want to hang out with their friends, can spend two hours spinning. Yep. Um, I have a question. If you have like a, let's say like a, eight, a late 18th century quilt, let's say that has like a chintz top mm -hmm. on it, and then you hear that the back is homespun, does that mean that, let's say the woman or something that made that quilt, it made could that be. whole backing on it? Or? It could be. I just trying to figure out what homespun. It's, yeah, homespun, homespun, is usually so in that slide that he talked about what he bought and he talks about homespun how homespun can be an economical way and homespun is worth doing so homespun means you made it in your home versus somebody else's home um, and it's it's come to mean and again here's another little 20th century thing uh, so for us, uh, those of us who knit you go to the yarn store and they have lion brand homespun which isn't spun at all, right. okay? Really and it's all lumpy. Yeah. I mean, it's fun to work with, but it's it's not spun. It's not twisted. And it doesn't make a particularly strong. No, it arc. doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't knit up yeah. really, really good. It's it's for Afghans. Um, but that's how people think of homespun, of being uneven, being poorly done, when. Homespun, as he was describing it, is just as good as the superfine broadcloth that you can buy in the store. Now you have to have a fulling mill that knows what they're doing. You have to have spinners. You have to have spinners that are all of equal quality uh, because that's the other hard part when we do something for spinning that you're all trying to do it the same way is we all have our little different styles and you have to adapt to make sure everybody's spinning the same way, but they've all got the same kind of spinning wheel. And actually, they all have the same kind of flyer uh, because Jonathan Bosworth of Bosworth Spindle's Journey Wheel studied 18th century wheels, and he came to me and says, you know, the flyers are all alike on those. The mandrel are all identical. Where are they getting them from? Because they're not, they, if these are all, all these spinning wheels that you've seen from all over that are from New England, or from the US, American wheels, they all have the same mandrel. Took a little bit of work, but I found an advertisement for a shop in Philadelphia that had an extra shipment of spinning wheel irons. They were importing them from Holland. So you were importing that part that you couldn't make here and then building the wheel around it. So they are, really are all spinning on the same the flyer, that important part, you're spinning on the same wheel. So you're all spinning consistently. And do those mandrels give rise to some, have you looked at Dutch wheels of the period? Do you see that? I don't think he has. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Saying, look, here they are. Here they are. Or something like that. But that's just it. He, he went through, and I know he did a lot up yeah. with the old um, textile museum and looking at the ones there. He's like, they're all alike. What's going on? They did start making them here. Um, there's uh, advertisements for a um, bronze manufactory in Maryland that advertises in a New York newspaper that they have spinning wheel irons. So now does he have spinning wheel irons for a flax wheel or for a wool wheel? I don't know, but they were being locally made. How common they were, because people were probably still importing them because, you know, imported is better. Did they share among households the wheels? No. All of these inventories just have the one wheel. One wheel. Or have their pair of wheels, yeah. Okay, yes, time to wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you.